I should have been terrified at the sight of the bomber, its sights already fixed on us, perhaps on the very building on which I stood. But I felt no fear. If we required such a response from the Germans, then this in itself was a victory. Perhaps on our own, the resistance fighters of the Warsaw Ghetto could not get the attention of the world, but we'd certainly demanded the attention of the Nazis, and their response surely would be noticed by the Allies. Not in time to save us, of course, but maybe we'd prove to the world that the Germans could be defeated, that there could be won. Yitzhak bundled up our few remaining weapons while I took Esther's hand to ensure we'd stayed together long, along the way. We hurried down the stairs, now in a race against, the, against a weapon that could flatten every building on this street. It was obvious where the bomber would drop its load. We only had to look to wh for where they were clearing the ghetto of Germans. Tamir directed us to find shelter in the bunkers, as far from the north gate as possible. But before we could join the others, Tamir grabbed Esther's arm, nodding at the matchbook she was carrying. I need that. The matches? He cocked his head towards a warehouse behind us. Nothing gets left behind for them to scav scavenge. Esther handed him the matches, and then he ordered us to leave with, while he ran back into the fighting. We darted into the streets, jumping over fallen bodies and debris, but I kept looking back until I saw a plume of black smoke rising from the warehouse, where the warehouse had been. Judging by now by how fast the smoke was spreading, whatever was in the warehouse would be a total loss, a major blow to German supplies. The Allies had done nothing for us, but Tamir had just done them a great service. By then, the bomber had arrived over the ghetto. It was painted camouflage green with Nazi symbols on both wings and trailed a thin line of smoke. I hoped we'd guessed correctly about where it would drop its bomb. Two doors swung open from beneath the aircraft and three or four objects dropped, not three blocks from us. From here, they looked like oversized animal droppings, but when they landed, the ground beneath us shook twice the first time from the explosion, and then again from the weight of buildings around the, the drop site collapsing. Yitzhak took Esther's arm to steady her, but I fell to my knees and immediately looked back for Tamir. He still hadn't rejoined us. I didn't know if he was alive or if he'd been caught in that explosion. I didn't know if all our people, people escaped the, that area or if any of them were now trapped between the Germans and the downed buildings. There was so much I didn't know. Meanwhile, Esther pointed out an entrance into another bunker, one we had helped to build. It was behind a false brick wall in a former apartment, but was assessed access through an air vent. She crawled through first, then I followed, and Yitzhak went last. Esther shouted out the names in Yiddish to warn the occupants we were coming and not to attack. When I emerged into the bunker, I stood against a back wall beside Esther, neither of us saying a word. Yitzhak started to speak when he came through, but quickly fell silent. Both fighters and civilians huddled together inside, holding each other in obvious grief and utter despair. But it wasn't about the bomber. Something else was wrong. What happened? Esther asked. They found the hospital, a man said not even looking at us. They killed everyone inside. Revenge for our fighting. They were, were all going to die anyway, someone behind me said. We knew that from the beginning. It wasn't that they killed the people there, a woman added. It's how they did it. Pure evil. Nothing less. I didn't ask. I didn't want to know or think about it. I shook Esther's hand again and whispered that the victims were at peace now. But the mood in the bunker grew heavier with each passing minute. No one talked. No one looked at it, anyone else. We sat in silence to wait until we received orders otherwise. After an unbearable half hour, Yitzhak began singing, softly, respectfully, in honor of our dead. My brother's song made me sad, but I also felt it healing me. As he sang, I took his arm and leaned against his shoulder 
reminding myself to keep breathing. For now, that was all I could ask for my from my body. I was exhausted, both, both physically and emotionally. Tomorrow would come far too soon. And when it did, I'd have to I'd have two I'd still have two good legs, a fresh supply of weapons, and an increased certainty that I was right to have come here. When Yitzhak finished, we sang another song together, and then another, and when we became silent again, I felt a little better. By eight o'clock that night, a note was dropped into the bunker inviting anyone outside who'd like to come. The Germans had left our part of the ghetto for the night, and there was something out there that the ghetto commanders thought we'd want to see. Yitzhak and I were among the first to leave, but once we got down to the street, many other people were already there. I followed their line of sight to the top of the building in Muranowski Square. Someone had placed two flags on the roof, large enough and high enough that they could should be visible from most places in Warsaw. One was red and white Polish flag. The other was the blue and white Jewish flag. It was supremely defiant, and I couldn't help but smile. No doubt it would add fuel to the Germans' anger and spirit to the heart of Polish citizens. It simply made me proud. Together we gathered to say a quick prayer for the dead before returning to our bunkers, waiting on the streets to give time to the civilians to go in first. As they did, Esther turned to me and said, I'd forgotten. Forgotten what? She shrugged, what it feels like to be free. Yitzhak chuckled. We're hardly free, Esther. We've never been more free, don't you see? They don't control us anymore. Since we already know how this will end, they can't even use the fear of death against us. There is nothing more they can take from us. But today we have taken their superiority and their belief in our submissiveness. No matter how this ends, history will recognize today for its greatness. Chapter 40, April 20th, 1943, Warsaw Ghetto. The second day of fighting was also the 54th birthday of the Fuhrer, Adolf Hitler. For his birthday, he would like we have sausage and potatoes and a hearty slice of birthday cake to go with his glass of wine. He should dine. He would dine seated on a padded chair with his closest friends and dogs nearby, and be surrounded by high-ranking Nazis who would assure him that the genocide of the Jewish people would be complete any day now, and they would toast to that. I woke up determined to disappoint him. So when. We heard a vehicle driving through the ghetto streets. I reached for my gun, but Yitzhak's quick peek from our bunker informed us that this was not a soldier, only a man in a black coat with a loudspeaker. His car stopped 30 meters from our bunker, making it easy to hear his introduction of himself as a member of the former Judenrat, or rather making it impossible for us not to hear him. I, scold I scowled, and checked the ammunition I loaded into the gun last night. My fellow Jews of the Warsaw Ghetto, listen to me. I snorted with disgust at the mention of his fellow Jews. We were nothing of the sort. Is it your father? A man near us asked Esther. Others within our bunker must have been wondering the same thing, or at least they leaned forward to hear her answer, failing to notice how her back stiffened and fists clenched. As far as we knew, Esther's father was dead. That man couldn't have known how unkind his question was. After a few shallow breaths, Esther shook her head. But I know his voice. I know him. They must be forcing him to do this. The Judenrat continued, Lay down your arms and surrender. If you refuse, the ghetto will be razed to the ground. My friends, I beg you to surrender, or everyone here will die. Everyone here will die? Yes, perhaps we would, but what did he think the consequence would be if we surrendered? We would not give up so easily. I looked around at the others within the bunker, most people leaning against the wall, grim-faced and with heads hanging low. Well, I asked, if you want to leave, now is your chance. 
although you must know where you will go from here. They all knew. No one moved. I creaked open the door of our bunker to get a sense of what was happening. In other areas of the ghetto, the streets remained silent, except for the lone car escorting the Jude and Rat men. Then a single shot was fired from a building overhead. It hit the car, which might not have been the intended target, but it was a decisive answer. Our official refusal of his generous offer to go to the death camps today. But thank you for asking. Within an hour of his hasty departure, the Germans returned. This time we met them at Muranowski Square with fresh Molotov cocktails and a renewed determination to make yesterday's fight seem like a warm-up. We also had two stolen machine guns, each one capable of firing 600 rounds of bullets per minute. These guns could chew up concrete streets faster than the Germans would escape on them. Emptying our ammunition so fast, it would sound like pulling a zipper. Esther and I watched it unfold from a building overlooking the square. When we could help contain the retreating soldiers, we did. She filled each bottle with flammable liquid, lit it, then immediately passed it to me for throwing. My arm should have been getting tired. But if anything, each throw felt stronger than the one before. Our side was taking casualties today, but so was theirs. After an initial skirmish, they backed off to regroup. It wouldn't last long, but it did give us time to collect our wounded, which began the beginning of one of the first truly awful choices we had to make. We were ordered onto the streets, now strewn with, too, with far too many of our own, either dead or wounded. I didn't know where to begin, because who should we help? Our medical supplies were limited. We had only a few civilians in this part of the ghetto with any significant medical training. Not everyone can be safe, Esther whispered. She was right. Some of our fighters had wounds too serious for us to treat. Maybe we, sh we could make them comfortable, but nothing more. When the Germans returned, the dead would have to be left behind, unburied, unceremoniously abandoned. But who of the living could we save? I hated this. Reluctantly, we entered the streets, each breath drawing in the chemical residue of the explosions, the odor of sweat and fear, the smell of blood. From my position, I saw at least 20 fallen Jews. Half were already dead, or so near to it, that I already knew they were beyond help. Lost my spot. But close by, a woman with a gash on her arm, the same one who yesterday morning had celebrated the German blood in the streets. It was easy to send her back into the bunker, but there the decision became harder. I knew very little about medical care, and apparently no one else had any better understanding of what we should do. How should we choose? Would we choose would we save one life at the expense of another?